Harry man. How are you? Look at this dude, bro. Stay put over there because I can see that we're going to start with Debru. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're going to talk a little bit about interesting things as always. Wait, we'll get started now. Leave a like and a thumbs up. And tell me if you agree with what we're saying or if you have the dog that we're going to show you now. Give it a hug, David. A hug. Dot. Before we start. Edgar Bruce Trio, here's my colleague who has a new CD out. It's about to come out. I'll just take advantage of the gap. I'll leave it there. If you want to check it out on YouTube. He's got some great music. He's a guitar master. And there I leave it. Let's get started. Today I've brought you some previews so the audience knows. Hey, we're going to analyze a specific breed that became fashionable and we're going to watch a couple of videos and we'll figure out the positives and the negatives. As always, with respect to the people who appear, we are going to give our most objective opinion and together we are going to try to learn. Okay? Ready? Let's go. Let's do it. Would you like to buy a Czechoslovakian wolf dog like mine? My recommendation. Don't do it. The Czechoslovakian Wolfdog is a breed that became known for the movie Alpha, where a prehistoric boy rescues and becomes best friends with a wolf. And more recently, my friend here had a bad reaction to Scatty and the case went viral. It is said that it is a laboratory dog, since it was created by Ipala, the army of the former Czech Republic in the 50s. They used 48 German Shepherds and 4 European Slobas to create a hybrid, a dog that has the trainability and intelligence of a German Shepherd, but the strength and endurance of a wolf. Since the German Shepherd is a very protective dog and the wolf has a very strong pack instinct, you will understand that the Czechoslovakian wolf dog is not a dog for beginners. They are intelligent, brave and protective dogs, both independent or somewhat headstrong and at the same time very dependent on their owner. They will get along quite well with other dogs and, since they are not PPP, they will be able to go without a voice or run. There are no laboratory dogs, not the Czechoslovakian wolfhound, nor the Doberman, nor any of them. In the end, they are people who have dedicated their lives to having their breeding grounds, uh, well, their crosses, wherever they may be, in their homes, on their plots, in their chalets, in their, in their, in their, in their place of residence or well, wherever they do it, but it is not a dog that is not very bad to say, very ugly, it is a laboratory dog, as if it were an experiment. Well, dogs and wolves have been crossed for time immemorial too. People who let their dogs loose. Well, and wild dogs that can cross with wolves, but the fact of already creating a standard, a breed in that way to create a dog, to also, uh, obviously be able to work, market or, uh, be sold as a fashionable item, because we already see that it is fashionable. Because of the movie, for whatever reason, uh, well, that's what there is, right, as always, right? Uh, but it is not a laboratory dog, there is no laboratory dog, right? In reality, a dog from a kennel that, like all people who breed dogs, like all purebred dogs since the 16th century onwards, but dogs and wolves have always crossed, either on their own or humans doing it. In fact, in the United States they sell true hybrids of a litter of a wolf with a dog, not only creating a breed of dog that looks like a wolf, but also directly a logo of an American wolf, a Canadian wolf, a normal Canadian wolf. Normally because it seems that they are more productive, more submissive, and, well, they have a temperament with German Shepherd Dogs or whatever, but in the United States we can see that direct wolf-dog hybrids are sold, not a breed of dog, but the true direct hybrid of the dog. Thanks. 
Dot. But let's say that there is no dog of reason. Well, he didn't say it like that. Well. It seems that it seems that they are there. It seems that they are there in the laboratory breeding. Crossing. What other little things do you see? What? Other little things do you see apart from? Well, as they always forget to analyze and explain that there is a birth temperament in all litters, whatever the breed and the canine, and that they have to be carried without a voice because it is not PPP. Ah, uh, it is very rude. To say it, without a voice and without a leash, he says, yes. Ah, uh, they do have a more primal instinct than other individuals, although there are always variations, as we always say. However, if there is an instinct with a higher degree of predatory instinct or intrinsic insecurity, that's why some people are a little suspicious, and many people have called me with client dogs, with dogs of this type, with wolf dogs that destroy houses, with a very strong primary instinct, that destroy houses, that destroy wooden furniture because they like to bite too much and can even be dangerous with other smaller dogs because they see them as prey. In other words, they have a more natural predatory instinct, more primitive than any other dog. Obviously, all dogs have it, but all wolf dogs like mine, Sarlos's or this one in particular have a higher hunting instinct than a normal dog, obviously, because the wolf genes are in their minds. Well, beyond the fact that it says that they can't be kept loose, I mean, sorry, they can be kept loose and without muzzle because they are not considered PPP. Well, we'll see that later, it's very risky. Let's first see what the animal's temperament is like beyond the instinct it has. Let's see what temperament it has. Maybe a miracle comes out of it, a submissive dog or a sheep dog, as we call it, and hey, what's the problem? I mean, no problem and that's it. But whether or not it's considered dangerous is something that will be seen. Let's see, David. And so that everyone understands, in these dogs the genotype of the temperament will be much more noticeable. It's very pronounced, the animal's movements are more marked. Like dogs that are very insecure in their body language or dominance, everything looks more exaggerated, right from the beginning, right? Exactly. Well, I was going to say, no, it simply doesn't depend on whether a law classifies it as PPP or not, it will depend a lot on the behaviors of the animal. I don't care if it's a pit bull, I don't care if it's an American Stafford or whatever. Well, the breed does have traits that are dangerous because of its power and such, but that doesn't mean it really is. And in this case, for example, here in my town, which is Villanova True, there are municipal ordinances that classify the animal not by its breed, not only by its breed, but by whether there have been repeated episodes over time in which it has been shown that the animal is aggressive. If so, it is considered an aggressive animal. So, it is very risky to say right off the bat and just blurt it out like that, when you have this guy, he must have a thousand or thousands of followers. Who must follow him faithfully and of course, everything he says sinks into people's minds and stains the reputation of this animal, right? It's not exactly like that. First he says, first he says, first he says, it's not for everyone and then he says we can take him off leash. We can take him off leash in places where he can be taken off leash and with super control of your dog, incredible, learning his psychology. Such, since it is a dog that does not have a very deep-rooted functional intelligence, since, well, it is not a Malinoa, it is not a Malinoa that already has German Shepherd, but the thing is that people already think that the German Shepherd here is half German Shepherd, half Wolf, that it does not work like that. Right?
So it is a dog with a more powerful instinct than a conventional dog and, well, you have to have extra control, right? At first it says, that it is fine, of the world. But then it can get loose. I do not understand. It is consistent. Of course. No, it already generalizes the fact that, uh, it will not get along with other dogs. Sorry, it depends, right? Of course, uh, uh, it is very bold. I find it very bold. Because they talk, because they generalize and that is a mistake. Ah, uh, we follow this guy a lot. We see many things in him. I've been watching him for a long time and we see many things he says and he always generalizes about the breed and as we always say, the important thing is to understand the genotype of the temperament at birth regardless of the breed. Because a canine is a canine. What is obvious is what is obvious and we can't be constantly saying in the entire training sector that the breed is like this. This is like that. This is like this because those are myths and legends. Because then everyone gets a boxer thinking that it's a dog for children. Thinking that when they see a child they're going to say, I'm a dog for children, I want a boy. And if you don't understand the animal well and the boxer also has a strong predatory drive because in the end it has its genetic memory to grab, which is a bulldog, who alone and you get a high temperament, doesn't find symbiosis and that boxer bites a child and then we say that that boxer went crazy. Please, let's leave the myths and legends aside. Genotype, temperament from birth and learn from real dogs their true mind, instinctive and adaptive. You already know. In there. You call us and you learn well, come on, there is. Another thing that I have left for the end and for me it is the most important. It is that for me personally, when he says, if you want to buy a dog like mine, forgive me. And here I do not want to be disrespectful, but it pisses me off that even today you want to buy a dog on a whim, when in the pound, in the pound there are dogs of all types. There are dogs today, there are purebred dogs. Before you did not see so many, today they are full of purebred dogs simply. Because of these generalist messages that are generated, which tarnish the idea of the animal. This dog is super good. I am going to buy it because I want a good dog and then the dog turns out to be dominant. You don't know how to control it precisely because of what you said about not knowing how to get into its mind and know what it's telling you or how to control its instincts. And that's where it gets out of hand and the kennel ends and it's a cycle that ends and begins with buying a dog and I'm very sorry if I make enemies, I don't give a damn. I'm against buying dogs. I'm saying it this clearly. Enemies of reality or enemies of lies. Here we say things as they are. I think we are the few who are actively and passively saying, learn about dogs as soon as they enter your life here with this and then it's a competition about whether they are better or worse, you'll see. But I'm fed up, David too, with the typical call, the thing is I've been doing everything up there for two years from trainer down, because we are not trainers. We are ethologists who study empirical evidence in the field with many years of experience with packs of dogs of all kinds and we know and try to make it super easy because the dog lives in the moment. The problem is that people wait so long to learn. Imagine having a dog like this that then causes a psychodrama in the family because it follows standardized trends and that dog ends up in the pound. Because of the TV show, they always call me for the last chance to see if the guy on TV has the magic solution. The magic solution is very simple. Teach dogs their instincts well. Before they enter the house. And before they enter the house. That would be the key to success. The key to success in ending this massive abandonment of crazy people is to truly understand the dog. As soon as they enter the house and understand how harmful eye pinning and sound pinning are, which is what we do all the time without even realizing it, but we don't realize it because we don't understand it, because the massive trend that exists. You start it, but you are causing collateral damage, let's say, that you can't imagine. I mean, I don't know if I explained it well.
You are causing, well. You are causing an effect that is perhaps the opposite of what you want to achieve. That's why, if we calmly make another video the next day, a part about eye training by watching any other training video, which is what we keep saying, and my videos are on the channel, and Don David also talks about it every day, that if a dog starts working, experiencing the world through its eyes, especially a dog like this, what's going to happen? It's going to start preying on the street, on everything that moves, and also at home. In other words, we could have an animal that becomes our own predator, in our own home. And what's going to happen? Well, we're going to throw it to the shelter or the sacrifice, or the pound. That's why with all the massive trend of affectionate training, we have to be very careful and understand it well, because we have been trainers ourselves. That's why we know what we're talking about. And a trainer who has his dog super trained for himself, who dedicates himself to this and does unorin or echo or whatever, all the work test, is not a person who lives with his dog, with a normal family and is not dedicated to training. That trainer, normally that trainer has his dog for a long time, some more than others, locked in a cage for many hours to compress it. It is called compressing the animal so that when it comes out it does the show super fast. And look how curious, all these super trained dogs, if you let them smell being a dog in the basket for 5 minutes, a CPPE automatically disconnects them from functional intelligence. Wow, it is as if they take advantage of the time to smell. Yes. Capture, capture, capture. Many training dogs who often say, I have seen it millions of times, I did it too. They do not pay attention. It happened to me with Butchie and Palayo, they were super trained and when we walked they would go away and I would say, what the hell are you doing? Because their own instinctive mind prioritizes the functional. So it was like, stop with all this crap and I want to be a dog for a moment, right? And they would run away and drink and then ignore me. It was like, wow, they were saying, enough, enough with all this city plus and let me be a dog for a moment. Well, what their primitive mind is really asking them is, hey, recognize. The environment, where are you? Hey, what do I have to do to survive? Quote. Well, all those operations, functional operants, are absolutely useless to him in his life as a dog. We are talking about a primitive mind. Very fierce, unless he is, uh, evidently connected through food, rewards or punishment for lack and reward for submission. Uh, with the human, right? When he is with the human, he is a dispenser of momentary emotions, because there are emotions that are longer lasting, depending on the context, like when they bought me a fantastic motorcycle and I have an emotion for two hours. Let's remember, let's remember and I'll give you a parenthesis, sorry, the introduction, that when we create the emotion, it impregnates our thoughts, that emotion runs through our body and the body is impregnated with chemical substances that our own body generates. Dogs pick up on this. They pick up on it. Okay? If you know how to recognize that sensation, uh, well, of course, if they know how to associate that smell that we don't even perceive, but they do. Through their exclusive behavior. To an exclusive behavior they give rise to diverse situations, variants, okay? That is the basis of all the knowledge we are trying to explain. Zero parentheses, I don't think we've ever explained it like that, right? Well, well, I had to say it. That's easier than anything, I mean, ah, uh, the dog is born blind and deaf and has had a nose since birth to go to its mother's teat. So, it's like its senses have to be in order. And conventional training is based on discoordinating its senses. That's why everyone. So, I don't work, we don't work with dogs, we don't live with dogs, nor do we have a symbiosis through food, as if we were a dispenser, but I am a food administrator, 
but not a dispenser of momentary emotions, because the dog will associate dopamine and serotonin with puppy substances. Because, what are serotonin and oxytocin used for in the animal world? For us, it's also to feel a certain love for our offspring and to protect them more. They are hormones that are intended to protect the puppy, but also, obviously, adults discipline the puppies. That's why oxytocin is very important during the first two to three weeks of life, and serotonin. No, and all the enases, it's not that it's one or the other, there are clearly some. That produce more of that emotionality towards the mother's puppy, and all the neutropenia are combined there, which are all hormones, chemical substances that give information to the brain to protect because if you take away serotonin, which many experiments have done on animals, Many times the mother eats the puppies and due to a lack of serotonin, or many times this also happens in humans, in many women who reject their children, right? Sometimes there is a moment when they don't want them because also due to childbirth and such, the neurotransmitters are unbalanced and it's like there's a lack of serotonin, and also many mothers with psychopathic personality disorder, it's like they reject the baby. But that's totally a matter of the brain and the neutropenia. It's brutal, but nature doesn't usually happen because we want the offspring to be there so that the species doesn't become extinct. Ultimately, what we want is for you to realize that what is practiced through functional training, which is eye anchoring, produces the opposite effect in many cases. And an ordinary person who has a dog, wants to enjoy their dog who is not dedicated to training and trains a dog, then goes out on the street and the dog goes with its millions of rods like a great white shark. So, they are the small particles that we have in the eye that are capable of capturing the movement of things. Of course, so that if someone is watching it, they know, we have many more cones than rods, right? And the rods make the sense of perception much more rooted. So everything that moves is a predator, the dog is looking at a fly, right? Whatever, I. Explain this, I always explain it to, I often talk about. It, and this is such a natural fact, for example, the rabbit that is not a predator, but is eaten, the rabbit, what does it do when it sees a predator, a possible predator? It stays still. Why? Because instinctively, instinctively it knows that as soon as it moves a hair, the predator will notice the movement and go for it. That's why it stays still, okay? Well, if we transfer this natural fact to our pets, our dogs, what happens? Well, we are greatly enhancing that instinct. That's why when we are walking and it sees someone running or sees, well, we are talking about the hypothetical case that we are reinforcing the eye anchoring. And without reinforcing it, it already feels the, exactly, at least the curiosity, but if we reinforce it even more, well, of course, it reacts to scooters, balls, people running, cars, etc. Okay? That's why it's important not to reinforce this instinct. First comes the sense of smell, of course. And then the sight. Then, what do you say? No, you have to exercise your sense of smell. What you have to do is keep their senses in order, and even more so with a Czech wolfhound or a Sarlos wolfhound, the Italian wolfhound, with dogs and wolf hybrids. I'm not talking about those that are directly, as we said at the beginning, a dog with a wolf, which is already brutal, but also, well, with all these types of dogs that are so fashionable now, we are going to multiply their instinct by 1000 based on that genotype of the temperament at birth that greatly influences it. For example, a Czech wolfhound that has a very submissive instinct, it will be seen in its body language much more present, much more exaggerated when it has insecurity when it curls its tail and such, the more primitive, the more exaggerated the behavior of its predecessor will be seen. More natural, right? Almost. Yes. 
I would say that a person's emotions can never be greater in time than what the dog can feel at that moment, because in the end that's what we're talking about, the dog can interpret that your emotionality is associated with that of a puppy and one day it will be the one who corrects the puppy. So you always have to control. Your emotionality, seeing the dog as a pretty fashion item and on the outside by the phenotype, by the happy phenotype. That's why we see the little wolf, my little love the little wolf, stay still. He's doing it, he's doing it, if you want to go outside. He's giving me signals all the time, if he moves a lot, daddy, 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 daddy. He's saying, take me out so I can pee like a child. A child who pees, look at me. See, talk to him if you want, if you want, go and talk to him. Now, 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 come on, now, come on, now, don't worry, what am I telling you? Well, you have to know which emotionality corresponds to each moment. And what happens to people who are so in love with dogs? They love dogs so much, aesthetically, visually, that you are filled with an anthropomorphic emotion, a kind of baby, a living doll, a little soldier and such, which has happened to everyone, that you get so excited that you start to secrete a lot of dopamine and serotonin and all the usual stuff and because the dog feels like a good puppy, not 100% puppy, it feels like a bomb of emotions. Come on, annoying. Oh my god. Man, it's been 25 minutes and he still hasn't shown up. Little guy. They just don't stop, huh, friends? Let's learn the no, you see? Now I have dopamine and it's taking advantage. Now we're here partying and this isn't going to happen. The guy above is getting excited because they associate our mind our body our internal and external smells with what's happening and this is a constant association that's why we say we are natural trainers because in reality we are training but like a primitive neolithic man with ancient canids or a paleolithic man with his first canids that approached Seriously, they're driving me crazy today. They're driving me crazy today. Well, I'm going to take them outside because they're already sending me messages, okay? Okay, great. I think that's it for today's video. It's been quite interesting. Oh, by the way, as a final detail, uh, he's going to make food for the dog that we saw later. He was feeding it the whole time. Did you notice? He was there all the time so that the dog would be there. Oh, I don't know, it's that this creates eye fixation, smell fixation, obsession with food. It's that my friends, dogs aren't with me for the food, but because they trust. In us, in our protective leadership. You can see it in your videos and I uploaded a video yesterday on my Instagram channel Camino de Huelas and you can see the same thing when I let Blues, who is my dog, loose and I don't call him. He is attentive to me. He looks at me and comes because he knows where his reference is. I don't play with food. No. No, it's not that the symbiosis we have with the dog and my bond with the dog is through my own self, my own being. I mean, it's like the dog is part of your body and I am part of the dog and the dog is part of me, but not because of the food. I'm not a dispenser, I'm an administrator, obviously. David, a big hug. Dej, a big hug. Thank you very much for watching, sharing and above all commenting. We'll read you and see you in the next episode. Hatter, thanks for being there too. We love you, see you. Later. Bye.